Good evening again. Uh, it is our immense pleasure and pride in welcoming Mr. Raj Jaydev. Uh, Mr. Raj Jaydev is a 2014 Ashoka awardee, Ashoka Fellow, 2018 MacArthur Fellow, and he's a proud son of the Silicon Valley. Uh, he has actually uh, uh, decided to draw, uh, tread on a path that is so uh, special because it speaks the language that ICA has always tried to uh, support and to adopt. He's basically shown the power of community organization, grassroots collective action, and he has created an environment for participatory defense. His uh, organization, Debug, is right now has currently also set up the Albert Kobarubias Justice Project. All this started because he started recording or chronicling the stories of various underserved and marginalized communities where their situations needed a more stronger voice. And this is how he ha Debug has now sp uh, spawned into many other states in the, United, in the US. And we would love to hear his story. And we would like to also be very grateful to him that he has agreed to participate and help us in trying to highlight an, a symbolization of what we really stand for. Thank you, Mr. Jaydev. And now over to you. Thank you, Mayu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jaydev. I am here ready to advance the slides for you. And, uh, okay, I, I could do it from my laptop. You, you, would you like to do it? Go ahead. Sure. Please. Which is easier for no, you. please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, if you have it ready to go, please do. Yeah, sure. So let me, before I show some pictures, let me at least just start by saying how honored I am to be with you all this evening and this morning. And it's just deeply inspiring to me personally, uh, because so much of what I do now, where we're headed, it has been coming from the philosophical underpinnings, the lessons learned, the historical uh, victories that have come from India. And so even in the title, Indians for Collective Action, uh, my understanding of collective action has come from India, um, from our, my experiences when I've been fortunate enough to go there, but also even my imaginations and my lessons and learnings from my father, from my mother, um, and also great global leaders like we just heard from Dr. Abe and, and you all, and all these various projects that we've been sharing earlier this evening. So it is really uh, profoundly powerful for me to join you all and share a little bit about how we're engaging that conversation that I think in a lot of ways is an expression of ICA in the US context in a time and moment in our country's history where there is an unprecedented amount of community action reckoning with larger social systemic injustices and oppressions. And maybe a real opportunity to not only be the change that we wanna be, but create a new world so that this form of suffering that we're, they're challenging and organizing around won't exist by the next time we have this gathering. And hopefully it'll be in person. So let me see if I could share some slides. Um, so I'm gonna share screen and you tell me if uh, you could see the screen in the photo as I share it. Yes. So you, you should see a vibrant crowd, and this is my hometown, I'm calling in from San Jose, California. And what you're seeing uh, happen all across this country, actually all across this globe, these are street actions where communities have come together to march, to rally, to fight against racial injustice in the wake of the murder of another black man in the US, George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, and it ignited a passion in a sense of urgency uh, that occupied all over the United States and communities and literally shut down cities uh, and states and has created a whole new opening that otherwise seemed impossible or too aspirational. Uh, the reason why I wanted to bring that this up is because if we were having this conversation really in any other time in American history, the context would be very different. 
but this is a moment of possibility and, and a moment where we could radically transform the world. So these social ills that we're all dealing with may be part of our past, not be part of our future. But let me tell you what else I think I, I'm seeing when I look at this photo that is kindred to what I think ICA stands for and certainly what I learned from great leaders in India. When I was in India, let me give a little personal background because I usually don't share that kind of thing, but I feel very connected to you all. Uh, I was born and raised in the US and I wasn't raised around a lot of other Indians. And for some of you that are on the call or some of you that have relatives that were born and raised in the US like I was, that come from Indian descent. It is a common story where when we're young, we don't really have a connection to the culture and the identity of India. Um, but as we get older, that pendulum swings the opposite direction where there's a deep profound yearning to know who you are, where you came from and what it means. And because of that, after college, I went to India. I was fortunate enough to go through a fellowship program that sent community organizers to country to learn about community organizing uh, from other, other efforts and other struggles. And so I got to go to the soil of where my family is from in India. And it was there where I learned the magnitude and possibility of social action at a level that I had not conceived of. It's where I saw the workers movement there shut down the city. It's where I've seen political theories, theorists take their ideas and their philosophies off of paper and discussion and apply it into achievable actions that transform lives. Much as the projects that you all have shared earlier today and certainly Dr. Abe uh, described that had global impact. And so when I came back to the US, I was imbued with all that energy and that new perspective that uh, I didn't have before I went to India. And it was also baked in the history of struggle for liberation that has defined India and continues to today. There are several speakers earlier today that referenced Gandhi and Gandhi certainly is instructive as a philosophical aspirational point for me and on my work as well. And I remember looking at these words that were completely foreign to me and trying to find some understanding and substance behind them. So Satyagraha, for example, resonated with me deeply and so when I would ask my father what Satyagraha meant, and when I looked into it, when I went to meet with leaders in India, and they told me about truth force and speaking of Satya from the soul and Graha and using that, that force to make the change. And that is the ultimate power that communities have, regardless of how much money you have, uh, what social status you have, but that is inherent to our seeking of freedom and liberation. And so when I look at these rallies here that you see on this screen that happened all across the US, I certainly see a day of reckoning for racial injustice in America, but I also see satyagrahists. I, I see those that are walking in the spirit of Gandhi, spirit of King, spirit of Chavez. And actually, when you look at the the civil unrest right now, the, the social ac actions, what you're actually seeing is the largest social movements that have ever happened in US history, larger than the civil rights movement in scale. And so what that means is there's Dr. Kings in our streets. It means that there's Gandhis that we don't know yet that are in our streets, that one day we'll be telling our children just as we raise the name of Gandhi and King and Chavez. And so I wanted to take a moment to understand not just the tragedy of COVID and this pandemic, but this real shifting, this elbow in time where our fight for justice and freedom may have turned a corner that forever changes the rest of this country and this world. So I also wanted to bring up this slide to locate uh, the discussion a little bit in our work. In the front of this slide, you see some families that are holding symbols and flags and pictures of their loved ones that were killed by police. And that's why they're at the front of that march. Um, my work at Silicon Valley Debug has been about community action, has been about coming together and seeing how families and individuals who felt lost and alone could form a united front together to challenge those institutions and call for justice and demand answers that otherwise a singular voice they would not be responded to. 
And so they're at the front of these rallies, in front of these marches. And this is where the center and heart of our work is. It is in the streets, it is in the community. It's very kindred to what Dr. Abe said, which is you have to meet people where they are in order to have impact. And in the US, that is right now in the streets and it's in the courts. And the other thing that I see when I look at the modern moment of racial justice and that struggle, and I contextualize it in my understandings and in full admittance, um, some romantic imaginations of what Indian philosophy means. Um, I think of what Buddha said when Buddha talked about liberation. And Buddha said, you need three things on the path of liberation. He said, you need the eyes to see the path. And as an organizer, I saw that as theorizing uh, analysis. And he said, you need the legs to walk the path to actually do the activities. And so when I see these marches, I am seeing people walking the path of liberation in the spirit and the way that Buddha talked about. But the other thing that I see that Buddha commented on when he talked about what liberation means is he said that one needs a Sangha, which is a community of practitioners. And the reason why I thought that was so parallel to what modern day community organizing is, is that we have this concept that liberation is a solitary walk, it's a soul journey. Um, but what Buddha said is actually the path of liberation, while the destination for each may be unique, may be different, could be collectivized. That is that collective action. And maybe we could get there sooner and in a more honest way if we do this in partnership with others, in a group, in the collective. And so what you're seeing now is a window into our organization, quite literally, <laughs> uh, with one of our first meetings that um, was described earlier of participatory defense. What you're looking at is families who are all facing arguably the most anxiety-filled, stress-filled, scary and fearful moment of their lives when they themselves may face incarceration or the person they hold closest to them and nearest to them and dearest to them may face the prospect of prison. So who you're seeing is Gail um, or facilitating meeting in the front writing notes. Her son at that time was facing jail. He was 17 at the time. Uh, her other son, Lamar, who was beaten by police um, and then had to face the uh, insult of being charged with a crime just because he was racially profiled and beaten by police was also in that meeting. Cecilia is next to him. Her father was being threatened with deportation because of an interaction with police when he was simply trying to find work and put food on the table. And Blanca is there on the left of uh, the screen with her son, Rudy, who uh, was developmentally delayed but was still arrested and falsely accused of a crime. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring that up in the context of a Sangha, which I think is what ultimately but, but, uh, Buddha was talking about our modern day work uh, at Debug and the work that we're seeing with all the other ICA projects, is that this otherwise could have been the task of an individual. Gail would have had to face and fight for the freedom of her son but she would have done it alone. Ceci would have had a fight for the freedom of her father and their family to be reunited, but she would have been alone. And that sense of isolation is freezing, it's debilitating. But if we could collectivize this approach, that fear does not seem so daunting. And that journey and that road to liberation can feel achieved uh, and, and certainly put into practice. And so while the destinations may be different, what community organizing is promising is similar to what the movement uh, in India taught me and these projects in NICA are doing on a daily basis. It's saying that we are stronger together than we are alone. And not just in force, but in brilliance and in intelligence and in innovation and all the other uh, examples that we share today. And so what these families did is they uh, define themselves not as an individual facing institutions, and in institutions of the criminal punishment system that right now has incarcerated nearly 2.5 million people in the United States. And when you think about not them just as individuals, but as extensions, pieces of families and communities, it means that communities have been decimated 
not just in San Jose or in Boston or in Nashville or in New York, but generationally across the country. And so these are people that are taking the same courageous steps that people are taking in India and have taken before when they fought against imperialism, when they fought for their health rights, when they fought for workers' rights, applied in an American court context. We call the approach that we started participatory defense. And it is an organizing model for families whose loved ones are facing criminal charges and how they, not as lawyers, but as family members could impact the outcome of cases. And when I heard Dr. Abe talking earlier, it felt so similar, this notion that people should determine their own health, that they could guide their own pathways. We're, we're essentially articulating that same spirit in the US court system saying that families themselves, communities themselves don't need to only be at the mercy of judges and lawyers, but could actually be agents of change to make sure that their loved one is free and home with them. And so we started this model and it started having tremendous impact. Uh, we started seeing charges get dropped. We saw sentences get reduced. We have seen people that are facing lifetimes in, in prison come home and rather than being kept, 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 uh, kept in a cage. And we started seeing that what we could do is tell the fuller story of people, they themselves, not us, um, not the lawyers, not the judges, and that that narrative was actually the most powerful story in the courtroom because it humanized something that had been sanitized from that basic principle of humanity. And so, uh, for example, what families wanted to do when we would leave a courtroom, when we're walking back to say the parking lot and we say left a sentencing hearing where someone's son was just sentenced to five years in prison or someone's mother was sentenced to 24 months in jail. The most common refrain we heard from people was not so much, this is unfair, this is unjust. And that sentiment, that righteous indignation certainly was true. You almost didn't have to say it. But what the most common thing they told us was, I wish they knew him like we know him. I wish they knew her like we know her. And so for us, we had to answer that call. And we started creating ways for families to tell their story. So one of the first ones that we did is something that we call social biography packets, which are packets of photos and letters that are used to sort of intercede and intervene in a court process that has been an assembly line of incarceration. One of the first ones that we did, uh, just to show an example, was of a father named Carnell who would come to our weekly meetings like the one you're seeing today, uh, where families are working tactics and strategies on impacting the case. And he'd sit quietly in the back of the room and rather than say dissecting a police report or trying to change a prosecutorial theory, which is what all these folks here are doing. He approached me later on in the meeting and he said, look, here's the situation I'm facing. He had been charged with a low level crime that for the most part would not require any prison commitment, but because he had prior offenses and the way the California legal structure is set up was facing a minimum of five years in prison for simply a, a, a singular drug charge. And he knew he needed help. He knew that he had, he had relapsed, which is a common thing that happens with people who had had a history of addiction, but he was overcoming it as much as he could. And he said, look, I could go to prison. I've been there before, but as a single father, if I get incarcerated, they're gonna take my girls and the system will have my children. And so, we knew him principally as a father. He'd bring his daughters to our meetings. They'd sit in the back of that room and, and color. And we said, well, why don't we give you a camera and you tell us who you are and who the court needs to understand you as. And so he took the camera and he took photos, made a photo essay of making the girls breakfast and picking them up from school and doing homework with them. All the things that a great father and great dad does. And it became this photo essay that he gave to his attorney. And his attorney, without looking at it, said, look, this judge has already said, you have a five-year prison commitment coming to you at the next court date. 
There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He has already given an indicated sentence. So there's very little you could do. Carnell said, why don't you try sharing this packet? And so at the sentencing hearing, even though the judge had previously indicated a five-year prison commitment, he looked at the photos and he had a whole new understanding of who Carnell was. He understood Carnell not as a repeated drug user. He understood Carnell as not just a case file, not just another black man in his court that he was gonna send to prison or jail. He understood Carnell as a committed father. And he understood the impact of incarceration, not just on him, but on his daughters. And after seeing that photo essay and on the record in court, he said, because of what I've seen, I'm gonna turn that five-year prison commitment into a six month outpatient drug program, which means that Carnell could be home with his girls. His kids would have a father in their life. He would still get the treatment that he was searching for and not have to face incarceration. So this is Carnell um, with his daughters. And you know, I sometimes joke when I show this photo on Zoom that it looks like I, I, I typed in happy family on Google and this one showed up. Um, that this really is a, a true story of a beautiful family um, that because they became the agents of change, because they were satyagrahists in my view, and I know that is maybe totally a fictional interpretation word <laughs> of how to use that word, um, but his family's united. And when you think about the impact of incarceration, it means that his children now will not suffer the same harms and social ills that the legacy of incarceration leaves and their children won't either. So this was a stoppage of generational violence all because Carnell had stood up and decided to be that agent of change. And so we started sharing these stories. What we realized was there was still a little apprehension because of the power imbalance. Well, communities would say, yeah, sure. I wish I could have a similar story. I wish I could free my loved one from jail or prison but I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge. And we say, hey, look, if you came into this meeting and you're sitting in the back of the room and you know that your loved one is facing uh, incarceration, if you do nothing, the system is designed, is a system in this country that came from slavery. It is designed to give your loved one uh, incarceration. And the terminology they use is called time served. That's the way they quantify time of incarceration. But if you engage, if you participate, you can turn time served into time saved. That's them home with you, living the life they should be. And we realize, and I think this was similar maybe to uh, some of the spirit of what Dr. Abe was saying, is that there's an inherent power imbalance that could alter and shift. And when that flattens out and becomes more horizontal and shared, whole new possibilities occur and open up to people that thought they never could have that capacity or bandwidth to do. And so we started seeing more and more people stop incarceration and keep their families united. What we realized we had to do though, to share the model just be, besides with people we knew um, was let them know evidence, empirical evidence that they could be agents of change through collective action. And so we came up with a way to, to express time saved. And we started totaling the numbers of what someone was facing when they first came to this meeting versus what happened after they worked the approach. And so Carnell, for example, would represent five years of time of incarceration. And so when we totaled the numbers, just after two years of families meeting week in, week out, um, that told they'd never see their loved one again, and they'd never be the same when they come out, we had a total of 1,862 years of time saved from incarceration. And when you think about the irreparable damage of just one year of incarceration, and then you amplify that to exponentially more large numbers, you think of how beautiful collective action can be and how much more powerful communities can be than even the institutions that were trying to harm them. And so this is Ramon who's holding the sign. We had a party with all the families that made those numbers and the lawyers. Um, and we had 1,862 years. Ramon was actually facing a life sentence. He was wrongfully accused of a crime. He was gonna commit suicide in jail when I visited him. 
and he came home after six months from his family's hard work, who had produced evidence that proved his innocence. And we actually got what's called a factual finding of innocence, where the court acknowledged their wrong, something that hadn't happened in our county in a quarter century. And so what we found though, and this is again why I'm so excited to be talking to you, is similar to what you saw in the last presentation when the doctors shared uh, how they, they sort of piloted uh, out the model in one village and you saw it expand. Because the brilliance of innovation isn't in the exceptional, it's in the ordinary. It's a different measuring stick. So sometimes if you're say a lawyer, you try to show that you're the best lawyer and you could do things that no one else can do. But in the spirit of collective action, in the spirit of transformative change, the way you show acumen is by showing that others can do exactly what you're doing, that you are the same as them. And so we started sharing the participatory defense approach to communities across the country that were suffering from the same violence of incarceration, because we knew they're in the same situation we were in, but also could have the same impact that we had. So one of the cities, for example, which has really taken off is in Philadelphia. We have a network now of over 30 cities that are part of the participatory defense national network, all working towards this, these numbers of freedom. And I'm gonna show you a, a small clip of the video because the ICA team asked that I show a video and I'm always happy to show more of our people. Um, so I'm gonna show you a video of Will. Now, Will was uh, a juvenile. He was, he was under 18, facing 10 years in prison. Um, he was out pre-trial, meaning he was still facing those charges. He joined the participatory defense hub. And one of the devices that we created was the introduction of what we call social biography videos, which are mini documentaries that are shown in court that explain more of who the person is, who their community is, is a way to sort of figuratively dissolve the walls of the courtroom so the judges could step out in the community, um, much as like what Dr. Abe's Chinese uh, proverb said of being with the people and also bring the people into the courtroom on their terms. And so this video is actually uh, Will explaining the video, then the second half of the video is actually what was shared. Um, it's only about a minute and a half, but uh, let me uh, see if I could turn that off. The district attorney only saw me as a number, one, one, six, two, seven, six, five. 10 years is a very long time that the district attorney wanted me to do in a state prison. 10 years, that's my entire 20s. Participatory Defense Hub members, public defenders, and me put together this video to show the DA who, one, one, six, two, seven, six, five, really is. This is one minute of that 26 minute video. This is my story. I am William Bentley. Tuesday, usually coming in, responding to emails that I checked on yesterday. That night, 4.30 to 6.30, I facilitate the Youth Participatory Defense Hub. Yeah, I clock out at 6.30, but I usually home talking to parents and making sure I can get the best possible outcome, making sure that the youth know that I am there for them and like I'm supporting them in every which way they can. If he was to be taken out of the community, this would be a, a big disruption. We would need help getting through that that process if he was to go to jail because he, he, he he's made such a big impact on all of our lives. But he's a real leader. He's just lent so much to the work we're trying to do to increase safety and increase justice in Philadelphia. I'm grown now, I'm a father. I don't want him to go through the same things that I went through, like not having a father. Like, it just made me realize that I, it's time to grow up. So that was Will. And because of the video was introduced in court, Will wasn't one of those 2.5 million that are incarcerated. They actually stopped the 10 year prison commitment. He now leads participatory defense hubs for young people in Philadelphia and has become one of the most dynamic leaders in that community. I'm just gonna show a few more slides. I know it's been a, a, a long evening, but an exciting one for people. The other thing I wanted to share though is that collective action isn't solely about wrapping supports around an individual to have impact. It's also about systemic change. And this is actually my wife who's in the center of, of the screen 
um, where we're leading a march with those same families that you saw earlier today on our jail after uh, someone inside that jail was beaten to death by correctional officers and died. Um, those correctional officers were actually accused of murder. Um, but we, we called on a march to get people out of jail and to stop this infatuation with incarceration. The reason why I want to bring it up is because those individual families didn't just help individuals get out. They make large history-making systemic change where we actually last week stopped the construction of a new jail. This photo was taken last weekend. Um, this is Benet and her two daughters. Uh, her husband was in the facility that was behind her that was torn down. Um, went on a, the, his, her husband went on a hunger strike because of the way he was treated to challenge uh, the inhumane treatment. And when you think of the legacy of hunger strikes, doesn't that sound familiar with Gandhi? Doesn't sound familiar with Chavez? This is what I mean that there is a lit legacy, a, a way you can actually show the lineage of the struggle from India and the civil rights movement to the modern day struggle. I'm gonna show uh, a, a split screen here and hope you could see it. This is actually a court in Bangalore and it's a court in San Jose. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to India last year to talk about participatory defense to see how it could seed uh, in communities in India. And what I stepped away with was it was the same basic common denominator where people felt confused, alone, without navigation, but that if they came together through collective action, they could push back about what they thought was their preconceived destiny and fate of incarceration and win freedom. So now we have discussions of participatory defense in the same state in, in Karnataka where my family's from, uh, which is extremely moving for me. And now they're, they're, we're having discussions of them starting the same exact meetings. It's similar to what Krishnamurti once said that always stuck with us at Debugs, the common refrain our young people say, where he said, you can't get wet talking about water, that some things you have to experience and collective action certainly is that same thing. I'll close with one final uh, image um, and it's at the beach here in California. Um, and I told you we have 30 cities across the country. We brought representatives from all those cities that are working participatory defense to fight for freedom. Freedom fighters in the same spirit as the freedom fighters in India. And when I said earlier that we totaled our time saved numbers, when we totaled it at the end of 2019, we had 10,208 years of time saved from incarceration as a result of community collective action. That's Will holding the number one on the far left. So we know it's possible. We know we need it. Quite frankly, we know our communities deserve it. I hope those of you that have been watching continue to support ICA in their growth because their impact has been remarkable. Uh, I've been awe-inspired just by seeing the stories and hearing the speakers. And I hope that the ICA movement continues to grow. I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you for allowing me to share some of our work in the US with the ICA family. Thank you so much, Mr. Jaydev. Very impressive human service and lots to learn from what you have said, you know, by doing, I, I don't wanna say simple things, but doing collective normal things, what amount of change we can bring to so many people's lives. Those numbers are, are enormous. We, I'd like to invite uh, Abhay Bhushan to virtually present you the award. And like Reshma had said with Dr. Bang, you know, hopefully we will get it to you physically sometime soon. But we really appreciate your taking the time and sharing this phenomenal information with us. Well, you know, we have heard from our speakers about the areas of their passion healthcare, racial justice. Uh, we are working with a lot of organizations on various global issues. Uh, in 2018, we started forming panels, both in person and then later on in 2020 in Zoom. In 2019, we had a meeting on different panels addressing areas of education. So one of the uh, audience, Manvain Dragav, asked a question, how do we coordinate the different organizations we support? 
uh, the way, one of the ways we do it is have uh, meetings now on Zoom, but we also had in-person meeting of the activists in India and people who are interested in here to address issues of education, water and environment, healthcare, women's empowerment, and livelihood generation. So these are the areas we work on it together. Now, what are, what are the reasons for which you to give to ICA? Of course, our individual projects and people are doing wonderful work. Please do continue to support them. We raised $2 million, over $2 million in the last 12 months. But most of it was for the specific projects we have already supporting. Now, if you want us to kind of do something with a new initiative, generate to I uh, present to ICA course. So I'd like to bring one of our don major big donors from the Agarwal Foundation, Prakash Agarwal. And I want to ask him a question because nothing like hearing from one of the donors why they got involved, how they did it. So Prakash. Abhai, Abhai you, need to, you need to honor uh, Raj first. Yeah, we, so you gotta be on- We uh, have to video. first do the thank you and the honor of- Okay, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Raj, I'd like to thank you very much for being a speaker today. Your talk was not only riveting, it is inspiring. I hope you'll be able to help all our young uh, in the Indo-Americans to uh, follow your path, to donate some time and energy into what you're doing. Uh, we've been following your career with a lot of interest and we've just had this opportunity to be with you and we just loved every minute of it. Sorry, it's been running late, but what to do? I could go on and on, but I would now like to virtually honor you for your humanitarian, give you the ICA Humanitarian Award. We will mail this to you along with her check and we hope you'll continue working with ICA. Now that you've established a relationship between collective action and ICA, we hope that uh, you will inspire us to do more things and we hope to reach out to you to start some new initiatives that we can help you with. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank much you. appreciated. Thank you. Keep in touch. Well, so go ahead. We have some... Uh, thank you, Raj. It's great to see you again. Uh -huh. On video. Thank you. Thank you.